Hey everybody, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you about a new book from Faith Matters Publishing. It's called Restoration by Patrick Mason. Um, When we started the Faith Matters Publishing Project, one of our goals was to explore what restoration really means as the church moves into its third century, and that's exactly what Patrick does. If you're like me and you've ever wondered how restoring Israel can be relevant to you, you've got to read this book. Patrick shows how, as members of the church, it's our mission to truly lead out in bringing wholeness and healing to the marginalized and the vulnerable. This book absolutely lit a fire for me, and it has totally changed the way I view my own engagement with the church and with the world. I really can't recommend this book strongly enough. It's the kind of book you want everyone you know to be reading, too, so that you can talk about it. So you can pick up a copy for yourself or for your friends and family at Desert Book, um, Amazon, Audible, and Apple Books. Okay, that's it on the book for now, but we'll be sharing a lot more in the near future. Thanks as always, and here's the episode. Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. In this conversation, we spoke with Brian McLaren about his new book, Faith After Doubt. Brian is a former evangelical pastor, best-selling author, speaker, and podcast host, whose ideas we found to be extraordinarily resonant for our own faith tradition. In this most recent book and in the interview, Brian shares his own experience passing through periods of deep doubt and shares how those experiences have been key for him to unlocking a greater sense of simplicity, integration, and harmony in his life. We want to make clear that we recognize that the word doubt has different meanings to different people. To some, it means an attitude of cynicism some bring to questions of faith. To others, it means an open and honest questioning without a predetermined outcome. It's really that latter definition of doubt that Brian examines in his book. And we know that this kind of questioning can be profoundly disorienting. But according to Brian, it can also result in a new kind of faith that leads to a deep and abiding love between ourselves, others, and our world. And while this episode is in many ways for those who have experienced deep periods of doubt, it's also for those who want to stand in love and solidarity with those who have. We really think there's something for everybody here. Thanks so much as always for listening, and a huge thanks to Brian for coming on. We hope you enjoy this episode. Brian, it it really is such an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking an hour to be with us. I'm so so happy to be invited. Thanks. (laughs) I loved your book. I loved your book. And Tim loved your book. And we have not been able to stop talking about it. And actually, I feel like it is a conversation that I am hearing all over our our faith community. It's just, it's really, it's really something that has caught fire and that everyone is talking about. It seems like everywhere I turn, there are conversations about this book. And one comment that I hear over and over, and I feel like it's usually the first comment, is that it's so striking that you are having the same experience. We have, we have kind of this idea that we are alone in this, in these hard faith and doubt questions and these growing pains. And it was so illuminating to hear all of these stories, your story and the stories that you tell, because they are so identical. They just map so identically to the experience that we're having as, as um, Latter-day Saints. And it was so comforting to know that we are, we are experiencing something so similar to the broader Christian world. So it, it, it felt like a lot of comfort and it kind of felt like an invitation into solidarity with broader Christianity. And, and mostly it felt like um, a real introduction into this whole new wealth of nourishment that I think a lot of us just didn't even know existed. So we're so grateful and so just so grateful for the role that your book is playing in our growth, you know, personally and in our community. Um, and we thought maybe for the listener, I would love for the listeners who haven't read your book yet to just get a little taste of what I'm talking about. And so we wondered if you would just start with telling us about your own faith journey. Sure. Well, I, I grew up in a wonderful, loving family, wonderful parents. My parents wanted to have a lot of kids and they tried for six years and thought nothing's happening. And then I was born and then uh, my younger brother was born 18 months later and then no more kids. So, uh, so we always knew we were very, you know, loved and wanted and uh, had from, from a really wonderful family. Um, both of my parents were from a little Protestant uh, denomination. Some call it a sect uh, called the Plymouth Brethren. And the Plymouth Brethren, most folks have never heard of them, but maybe folks have heard of Garrison Keillor. He used to have a big NPR show called Prairie Home Companion. He was from my background and he writes about wow. it in some of his books. And there's a kind of well-known uh, Christian political activist named Jim Wallace, who also is from this background, but it's not a very well-known wow. uh, little groups. Although it, it has a really interesting parallels with, um, with the history of Latter-day Saints, uh, which we could talk about if we wanted to really go into kind of nerdy religious detail. <laughs> Um, but in, in short, we thought that all Christians, uh, all existing Christians at the time our movement began in the 1830s had ruined Christianity and we were coming along to fix it. Mm. 
Wow. And uh, that, that together, sounds very that sounds very familiar. <laughs> when I got old enough to be a little bit cynical about this, I called it the Church of the Last Detail <laughs> because <laughs> we kept having schisms within our little group because that group didn't have it quite right. Now we're going to fix this and we will have it just right. And then you know, wow. I'm in the process of finding the last detail, but <laughs> loving people, you know, uh, and, and of course, when you grow up in any tradition it's what's normal to you and you assume it's the only way to be. Um, I started having problems really as a kind of a kid, young kid because I was really interested in science and dinosaurs and you know stars and astronomy. And uh, our church was very strict on literal six day creation. And so mm -hmm. I remember my Sunday school teacher telling me once, uh, I must have asked a question about evolution. Maybe we were reading the Genesis creation story or whatever. And I just said, you know, what about the dinosaurs and what about evolution? And I think my teacher said, oh, you have to make a choice. You either believe in God or wow. evolution. And I just remember thinking, you know, I, I don't see why this makes sense. And I remember thinking it won't be too long. I'll be old enough and I'll get out of this thing. <laughs> so, uh, and then add to that, uh, I, I was a, a guitar player and a musician and I played sax and some other instruments. And I started playing a little rock and roll band, which was totally considered sinful. And wow. so I just thought I was on my way out um, and I, I probably would have been. Um, but then I got, I, I had a couple of people who were, uh, were a few years older than me who, independently took an interest in me and represented a different kind of faith to me. And I ended up, one of them invited me on a retreat and I had this very powerful spiritual experience there. And so I ended up staying Christian, although I think I was no longer interested in just being within this very little narrow group that I'd grown up with. Um, and I, to make a long story short, I went to college. My plan was to be a, a English teacher because I love literature. And um, while I was in college, I was part of a little group that started a little dinner group, fellowship group to talk about faith matters. And uh, <laughs> that ended up becoming a little congregation. Um, I, I became a college English teacher and then gradually became the pastor of the, this, the leader of this little congregation. And I served in that capacity for 24 years and um, just outside the Washington DC area. And um, I started writing books uh, because I, 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 in some ways I started writing books for my own therapy. Uh, and, and in some ways, because I felt that there were certain, I don't know, truths that I needed to at least put into words or things that I thought were true. And mm -hmm. that led to more writing and what I'm doing now. Wow. So I'm curious if your experience, I mean, I feel like you write with so much depth about, about doubt. You can tell that this was a very personal experience for you. Did you feel like you experienced doubt for the first time and most meaningfully when you left your, you know, the faith of your childhood or did it, was this a, a, a second wave later when you were, when you were teaching from this new yeah. congregation? You know, um, it, it came in many waves really. Um, I think this will make sense. You know, when you grow up in a very strict group, uh, you think, oh, all the problems are with my strict group. If I could just get into a little broader group, all my problems would be solved. Well, then you get into that group and you find that it's just a slightly broader version of what you had before. And so <laughs> I think each time I break out into a little more space, I find out that there were deeper questions. And, and, I, and you know, one of my other interests is history. So I would try to learn the history of these different religious movements. And and then you understand, you know, everybody comes from a context. And one of the big things that actually was really at the core of the first book that I wrote um, is that I realized, you know, uh, historians often talk about the ancient world, the medieval world, and the modern world. And that's one easy way to divide up a lot of history into a couple mm -hmm. of categories. And, um, and, in, in many ways, you know, Judaism, Christianity, they arise in the, uh, in the ancient world. And then they go through these massive transformations in the medieval world. And then they more or le less effectively try to ad uh, adapt to the modern world. But what I started realizing is that 
the story of the modern world was kind of coming to an end. And there was what a lot of people call a postmodern world that mm -hmm. was emerging and that one of the problems for me, at, you know, as a very conservative evangelical Christian was that my faith didn't, it barely made sense in the modern world. It <laughs> didn't make sense in the postmodern world. And one of the interesting disco discoveries for me is that I found out there were Jewish thinkers going through something similar with Judaism and Muslim thinkers, yeah. and, uh, Buddhist thinkers. It was just sort of amazing to find out how what I thought was only a problem of my religion is really kind of a human problem. It, it happens mm -hmm. across yeah. religion and, religions and cultures. And yes. was there any particular time of your life that was like a like a real dark night of the soul for you in terms of in terms of doubt, or has doubt been sort of a constant companion that's helped you as you've you know stepped out into these into these bigger and bigger boxes? No, there definitely have been waves. Um, you know, uh, probably my first really serious wave was my senior year of high school, and then maybe my first two years of college. Um, and part of that was you know you you're suddenly introduced to more things that you didn't know, and you try to integrate it and. Uh, so that, that was my first really big wave. And, and really it continued through, through graduate school. I think graduate school it, in an awful lot of disciplines is the perfect time to doubt because in some ways, even as an undergraduate, you read textbooks that you assume they really know what they're talking about. <laughs> and then in graduate school, you read the original sources and you find out that everybody actually disagrees with everybody about everything <laughs> at some level. So. Um, so that was my first big, big wave. But then after I became a pastor uh, and I was leading a congregation, I went through another really deep wave. And it was in the early 1990s. And the thing about that, our church had experienced some kind of rapid growth. And a lot of the people who came into our church had no religious background, or at least maybe, you know, they'd been baptized Catholic as children and had never been back, you know. So they would come with their questions and I would give them the best answers that I had for my theological training. And they would walk out and I think they would sort of think, does he really believe that that is a good answer? You know, <laughs> like they think, I like this guy, but I can't believe he believes that. So uh, very often I, I jokingly say they would leave with my best answers and I would be left with their best questions. And then mm. on top of that, um, my wife and I ha have uh, four adult children now, but one of our sons was six years old in 1990, and he um, was diagnosed with, uh, uh, le with leukemia, and oh, he had wow. um, three and a half years of daily chemotherapy. Uh, he had a pretty tough, uh, you know, brand of leukemia to deal oh, with. Goodness. And, um, you know, I'm sure on top of everything else that added a sort of personal dimension, it it, I, it wasn't so much that I was doubting God, why did my child have leukemia? But I think I was more aware that a lot of the theology that I inherited within Christianity, I actually did better the less I thought about that theology. Wow. <laughs> um, you, you know, the, the theology in some ways made the whole situation worse. It didn't really, it, it brought more conflict and comfort. Yeah. yeah. The, um, in our tradition, the term faith crisis is becoming very common. Um, yeah. It's something that I think yeah, you could probably say over the last, especially like five to 10 years, yes. uh, it's becoming a very regular subject of, com of conversation. Yeah. And it often revolves around a couple of different areas for us. One is, um, one is like historical issues. Like our, our church you know, is a relatively young church. It started yeah. roughly 200 years ago. And for a lot of its history, sort of its its origins were not were not well known. And it's yeah. it just like all history, it, it can be you know it can be a little bit messy. Yeah. And you know, with the advent of the internet and uh, sort of just a a general uh, broadening of of information that's available to people, that messy that messy messy history has has uh, become known. And that's led a lot of people to feel a like they have a problem with the history itself. And B, they have a problem with the fact that they didn't know about it and they felt like maybe there should have been more transparency. And then the other sort of like broad category that I think leads a lot of people into faith crisis in our tradition is, is around like social issues, you know, um, LGBTQ rights, uh, women's rights, all those kinds of things. And, and a lot of, especially younger, you know, members of our church feel like 
I feel like the church, you know, maybe is a little bit, you know, behind the times on, on those sorts of things. And they find themselves internally in conflict with what they're, with what they're hearing at mm -hmm. church. And I'm curious, I'm curious if you, like, if that maps at all to oh, things that, yeah. that you see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, of course, one of the things in, you know, the kind of Protestantism that I grew up in is that whenever there would be something embarrassing in history, you just have a schism. So you can start all over again. So <laughs> yeah, now exactly. we're the pure group. <laughs> yeah. But then you go back and you try to look at sort of the big Christian history and, oh, talk about messy. I mean, and, and, you know, you realize that here is the, the largest, you know, speaking very generally, the largest religion in the world. Uh, what is it? 31 to 33% of the world's population identifies as Christian of some mm -hmm. uh, shape. Um, and then you find out there is dirty, ugly, horrible history that has never really been grappled with. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was taught when I was a kid uh, that, you know, good Christians abolished slavery. You know, they were, they were abolitionists. Well, nobody told me that a tiny minority of Christians were abolitionists. The vast majority were right. pro-slavery. Or yeah. And if they weren't pro-slavery, they were like, we don't want to talk about slavery. That's a political mm -hmm. matter. We want to talk about heaven and, and salvation and, you know, theology uh, and keep it uh, away from that. And I remember uh, I was actually writing a book. This is in 2010. And I, I mean, this is, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, but I got really curious, what did pro-slavery Christian literature look like? Now, thank God they don't publish it anymore. Um, well, they, they don't for general market, but they are re-releasing some of the classic pro-slavery wow. texts. And so I went back and read some of them in, as research for this book. And of course it makes you feel dirty, you know, to, to read it. But I, I realized that the way they interpreted the Bible is exactly the way people are interpreting the Bible today wow. to justify treatment of gay people or to mm -hmm. justify women being in an inferior position um, without ever calling it that. And, mm -hmm. and I just remember thinking, this religion stopped using its, its sacred text to, to prove what it was proving before slavery, but it never scrutinized its way of interpreting its text that makes you think equally terrible things could happen again. Wow. Yeah. It seems like that's, wow. that's one of the struggles that we often have as religious people is not realizing how much of what we believe is a sort of set in stone belief is actually just interpretation. Yes. You know, it's yes. very like we, we sort of, and it's, it's hard to get out of our outside of our own culture and our own chronology and recognize, you know, how much of that is built up just because of the air we breathe right now yes. you know yes. and so i love i love that your i love that your book sort of took a broader view and said we don't you know we don't know a lot that's kind of what the thesis of the book is we don't know and we don't know what we don't know you know yeah. yeah and this is one of the weird things that happens in in religion i think protestant christianity promoted this to such an extreme and i think it created the conditions that still have an effect for latter day saints i think mm -hmm. and it is that um, it was like we were out competing one another for certainty. Um, we, we have to prove that our group is right and, we, and we're certain and we can show you why our group is right and all the other groups are wrong. And, and the irony is that part of what I think maturity involves is realizing that certainty is overrated. <laughs> meaning yes. that, meaning, look, uh, I mean, one of yes. the hardest things for me in my 24 years as a pastor, I, you, you know, you can imagine over 24 years, I had so many people who had mental health crises. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you realize is that, you know, when you're dealing with a person who's deep in a manic episode, they are 100% certain. Or when you're <sighs> talking with a person who has a you know, deep case of schizophrenia and is hearing voices, you know, Bob Dylan is singing to him, you know, and, and telling him secret messages. Um, then you realize, oh, certainty is not, isn't correlated with anything in reality. Certainty is a psychological experience. And when you're looking wow. for certainty rather than truth, then you have to get rid of all unknowing, you know. But so much, it seems to me, of faith is how we live with unknowing. It's, it's living with unknowing by acknowledging that there's a gap between what's true and what I understand and what 
is out there and what I am aware of. And, and yeah. living with humility and wonder and awe in that gap of unknowing is very different than saying, oh no, we have a religion that gave us all the answers. We know everything. Maybe first, would you jump into um, just stages of faith? We really liked yeah. your framework. I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with Fowler's stages of faith, but yes. this felt more simplified. And I really resonated even more deeply with the with the way you described, especially complexity and perplexity. So um, maybe to start, would you just talk about why you simplified them? And, yes. um, and then just walk us through the, the four stages. So yeah, the first thing I should say is everybody should be aware that stage theories can be abused. Um, mm. They can be used by some people to look down on other people and judge other people and reduce other people to, oh, he's just this or he's just, she's mm -hmm. just that, you know? So we wanna be aware of the dangers. Like any tool, it can be abused. It's just the tool. Um, and then I guess the second thing I should say, my original exposure to stages uh, was not in the world of faith. It was, I was a college English teacher and it was part of my professional development to learn about what psychologists were saying about adolescent intellectual development. Oh, wow. And I was exposed first to a theorist named William Perry who was writing in a completely secular context but as I read this secular psychologist, I felt like I'm understanding more about my faith <laughs> than yeah. I have from anything I've read in a religious yeah. context. This matches so much. And later I read Fowler, and then later I read, you know, all kinds of other theorists, Ken Wilbur and many, many others. But and and but what I started to see is there's kind of a pattern. You could simplify it into two stages. I, I felt uh, four stages gave enough granularity. And there was a certain cohesiveness to each of the four stages. So it's very simply, it's simplicity. That's where we all start. Complexity. Some of us end up there and spend the rest of our lives there. Perplexity. Some of us uh, go from complexity to perplexity and we think there's nowhere else to go. Some people mm -hmm. get to perplexity and they decide they don't like it. So they go back to complexity or simplicity. Um, I, uh, and religion often does that for people. It gives them sort of a way to go back into simplicity, especially. And then I think what's happening is more and more people are, they get to perplexity and they find out there's actually something beyond perplexity. And I call that harmony. And it's a mm -hmm. deeper way of holding faith. Um, uh, and I know deeper could sound like a judgment or superiority, but let me just say it's, it's another way of holding faith that allows a lot of people to keep faith um, in a more honest way. Yeah. I, let me ask, let me ask this. Have, have you seen in your tradition at all, if somebody um, leaves uh, complexity, leaves that second stage into perplexity, and then, it, like you said, potentially there can be a, a movement back into those uh, earlier stages, but do you ever see sort of a, a, just a mirror image of the paradigm where they've, you know, maybe they've, um, completely thrown out their, you know, thrown out their faith, but they're just as certain about their not faith as yes. they were. Yes, yes. In fact, so if we could say it like this, so let me just, should I just give you a quick summary of each of the four? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Perfect. Okay, because the simplest way to say it is simplicity is faith before doubt. Mm -hmm. And we originally get our faith from our authority figures. And that doesn't matter if you're Latter-day Saint or uh, or Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist, if your parents tell you there is no God, you believe them mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. kids believe their parents. That's what our family believes, right? So yeah. simplicity is when you believe what your authority figures tell you. And, and authority figures tend to, to divide the world into twos, us, them, in, mm -hmm. out, good, bad, heretic, orthodox, however we say it, you know, safe, dangerous, friendly, uh, you know, and friend, enemy. Um, and that's simplicity. And, and a lot of religion, ha religion has a lot of practice in working in simplicity, giving people the rules, telling, telling us why we're right and they're wrong, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of a thing. Um, and then uh, complexity happens when, when I was that teenage boy who thought that evolution made all a lot of sense and I started thinking for myself, here's what happened in my mind. My Sunday school teacher said, oh, you can't believe in, in evolution and, and God. And I thought, maybe I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, I started thinking for myself. I thought, well, maybe there's a different way of interpreting that story. Maybe the Genesis story is 
a metaphor and you don't have to take it literally. And so, you know, you start thinking life is a little more complex. And when mm -hmm. I talked about learning about the history of my faith, or you were talking about how information becomes available on parts of history that have been sort of covered up. Oh, now life is more complex. And you find out, <laughs> you know, often this happens when you fall in love with the wrong person, maybe you think, <laughs> hold on, I was taught that only people of our group are good people. And I just met somebody who really seems like a wonderful person. Or you meet people in your own tradition who are scoundrels and you think, <laughs> well, now my simple world of we're good and they're bad breaks up. That's mm -hmm. complexity. Could it, could it be too that, that some types of apologetics fit into a complexity framework where like, I think a lot of times when you have that dissonance, like the one you talked about with, you know, believing in God or believing in evolution, apologetics, at least that I'm familiar with, often yes. to try to bridge that gap, sometimes exactly. in ways that are credible and sometimes that way, in ways that seem a little bit incredible, but like, they're definitely like drawing on scholarship and, you know, connecting mm -hmm. all the dots in sometimes complicated ways to make it all, to make it all work together. In fact, I would say, I, I agree 100%, um, Tim, and I would say, I think very often the smartest people in stage one, when they graduate to stage two, they get involved with apologetics because it allows them to be loyal to the group. But yeah. here's the difference. In stage one, if you ask a question, the answer is, this is what the Book of Mormon says. This is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. This is what our leaders say. Uh, this is what our apostle says. This is what our prophet says. Um, in stage two, they'll say, well, look, there's evidence, you know, uh, mm. and here's evidence. And so in <laughs> a sense, so interesting. At, at the end of the day, they want to bolster the credibility of those stage one sources, but they're, they want to look for evidence beyond it. And, and so I'll, there's a lot of very smart people, energetic people doing that kind of stage two work. And you find out, you know, uh, I, I grew up, you know, as an evangelical Christian and something we had in common with many Latter-day Saints is we wanted to convert everybody we could to the, the truth. <laughs> yeah. And then what really is funny, when I had a Muslim friend who was really working to convert me to becoming Muslim, you know, and just a few weeks ago, I was doing part of this book tour. I did a thing at a secular bookstore uh, virtually, you know, through Zoom. And the host was a humanist and atheist. And through the whole interview, he was really working to try to convert me, you know, <laughs> and, but, but it's great. And little, little do you know why we brought you on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, but stage two loves that, you know, yeah. It, it's, yeah, that's really, really fun part of being in stage two. The other part of stage two that I really resonated with was this, the idea that you're going to conquer this spiritual mountain. You're going to like take it in three steps. And you're going to become the best of whatever, like whatever somebody laid out for you, like you are going to do that and you're going to do it perfectly. And yeah, and it, 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 I feel like that really, we're like amazing at that at church. Like we've got programs for any possible way you could want to improve and it works, you know, like you, you can set some goals and you've got people that are going to help you. And like, we just, we are thriving in, we're thriving there. So yes. that was, yeah, that was so interesting to me. I've never heard that laid out on a stage of faith. And I, I really resonated with that, that and, feeling. You know, people develop, people grow through those programs, right? And, and that's why a whole lot of people stay in stage two uh, mm -hmm. for their, their whole lives. Um, uh, in, uh, you know, outside of Latter-day Saints, uh, in, in sort of the Protestant world, I think the mega church is the perfect stage two mm. expression of faith because they have a thousand programs and a thousand activities and and uh, and there's this feeling we're successful and we're yeah. big and, and we're growing and all of that really is stage two uh, crack you know I mean it's, it's <laughs> yeah. like, it makes you feel high I think yeah um, uh, and. Um, and then, though, for some people, that stops working. I think when they say they have a crisis of faith, very often, uh, especially if they're in the, you know, this might be hard for Latter-day Saints to understand because I think there is this big stage two component of, uh, of you know, your, in your community. But there are an awful lot of conservative Catholics and conservative Protestants. Their religion is purely stage one. They are given mm. no place to go. And it's even a faith crisis for them to go to stage two. Mm. Uh, wow. but, uh, but what happens to a lot of people is when they start questioning the goodness of those stage one easy answers. 
and they start to see all that stage two stuff is keeping us busy, but I'm not sure it's doing good for us or I, I'm not sure it's doing good for the world. Or, or Tim, when you mentioned people say we're hurting gay people and then you start mm-hmm. to have not just, you have intellectual questions, but often it's ethical questions. Is this really good? Um, yeah. And when that happens, very often it pushes people. And of course, what often happens when you enter perplexity is that all the stage one and stage two people think you're becoming a bad person. You're losing your yeah. faith. You're, you know, they think you're kind of going backwards when really your, your conscience is becoming more sensitive and your desire yeah. to know the truth is becoming more committed. And, yes. and it's one of the hardest things I think about being in a faith community, you, you, you're, you're insulted and sometimes condemned, you know, for being honest. Yeah, I love that part because I, I felt like you really articulated from this other, from, a, you know, it was a different community that you were talking about, but that experience resonated so intensely with me personally and, and in conversation with, with other people who've felt this perplexity stage. And the thing that I wanted to ask you, I, so we have this idea that, that doubt comes because you're not watering the proverbial plant, you know, you're not, if you, if you're not praying daily or with real intent, or you're not reading your scriptures, or you're not, you know, attending your meetings, then, then you um, become susceptible to doubt. And if you're doing, if you're doing all the, the complexity things, then you will be impervious to these feelings of doubt. And it just feels like for a lot of people, it, I think there's some part in the book where you talk about doubt being like a marauding bear or like yeah. mosquitoes descending. And I <laughs> loved all of those analogies because that, that was my experience. It felt like something that happened to me. Like I felt like I was really like doing all the things and I didn't want to feel doubt. Like I was in any way that I could have controlled for doubt. I was doing that thing. And yeah. so I loved the examples, all of the, all of the um, stories of people who were pastors or ministers who had that experience, like from the outside, it looked like they were at like the pinnacle of spiritual seeking, you know, and, and then they had this experience where, where doubt descended. And so I'm curious if you've found that there is a way to be impervious to doubt and if that should be our goal. Yeah. So here's the problem. If you are already perfect, then I guess you don't have anything to doubt. If you already are omniscient, you know everything. If every one of your ideas and beliefs is already correct, then maybe you don't need to doubt. But for all the rest of us, <laughs> we, better, we better not lose the ability to doubt because we'll yeah. lose the ability to learn. If we, if, mm. In other words, we will, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll be stuck in our illusions and we won't know will be stuck in our, where we've been misled or where we have a wrong idea. So, but I do think what happens to some people, especially when they're just coming into stage three, is it looks so scary for them that they double down and return to stage one with this sort of almost extremist, fanatical passion, because they're not really looking for the truth. They're really looking for certainty, for simplicity, to escape all that complexity and perplexity out there. And frankly, this is how cults happen. When I saw on January 6th, those hordes of people storming the Capitol in Washington, DC, and a lot of them were holding up Bibles. And I, I, I don't know if there are any Latter-day Saints in the group, but there were an awful lot of white Christian, Catholic and Protestant Christians. Um, but in a sense, Political extremism is something, simil- something similar. We, the, when our brains don't want to deal with co- a complex reality, we're, we're very tempted to buy into conspiracy theories and simple ways of explaining reality that, well, they have all kinds of psychological benefits. Even if they make yeah. our lives a little harder, they, they do pay certain rewards. Yeah, and it's, it's almost... And this is not to correct you at all, but like, it's almost not that it's not complex to me because like some of those conspiracy theories can actually be very complex. <laughs> yes. It's more that they're, it's more that they, that they're, um, it seems to me that a lot of believers are unwilling to accept the sort of non-dual nature of reality, yes. Yes. you know, the, the gray area and that some things yes. can be good and bad, you know, at the same yes. time. Yes. In fact, that's the, that's a really good clarification to make because 
yeah, very often the conspiracy theories or the doctrines or the politics of a cult are super complex. But the one thing that isn't complex, we are right yeah. and everybody yeah. else is wrong. And yeah. we're and we're on God's side and God's on our side and they're on the devil's side. And and that simplicity, I I must admit, I've never understood its appeal, but I know its appeal is real to some mm-hmm. people I know. Like I bet those people who were storming the Capitol on January 6th, I bet that was the happiest day of their lives. Maybe the next day was one of the worst days of their lives, but that day was one of the happy, they never felt like their cause mattered and they were true believers and they were following their their dear leader. I was just, this was reminding me about the, a conversation that you had with Jackie Lewis and Richard Rohr last year on your um, Learning How to See podcast, yes. where you talked about community bias. That was one that I felt like, oh, I can really see this in myself, that this idea that you'll choose tribe over truth because our brains are just wired for that. We just need it so deeply. So I wonder if you could just talk about that. You know, how is it even possible to have a community without community bias? Because we need that. I know we, I can feel that in myself. Like I need to feel that feeling of belonging, but I don't want to be blinded, you know, by by this community bias. So yes. is, is it even possible to have both? Well, you know, it's funny, um, Aubrey, when you say that a story comes to mind, I, I don't, I should have told this in the book. I, I don't think I did. <laughs> Um, but when I was going through that tough period of doubt in college, uh, I had a friend named Tom and we were sitting, I still remember exactly this room we were sitting and I was on one couch and he was across the room on another couch. And I told him, Tom, I'm just not even sure. I believe there's a God anymore. Some days I think Mm -hmm. there is. And some days I, it just doesn't make any sense. And, he's, and I said, I used to feel God's presence and I just feel nothing now. It's just like, it's just gone. And I was thinking, he's about to tell me I'm going to hell. And he's about, and he just said, that's okay, Brian. He said, uh, he said, I just want you to know, I'm your friend no matter what. He said, if you become an atheist and he says, I won't love you any less. Um, he said, mm-hmm. I'm still your friend. And then wow. he's, I'll never forget this, he said, and look, I need to tell you, he said, God feels very real to me right now. Um, and um, uh, and so I feel like I got enough faith for both of us. You, you're okay. And if I'm, if I'm ever at a place where I'm really doubting, I bet you'll be in a place where you can help me. And it was just this feeling like our friendship was real, whether or not we, you know, agreed on, on wow. this. And, and here's, the, here's the irony. At that moment, I thought, there really is a God <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because in the sense that the love, the unconditional love that I felt from him was what I think some deep part of me said, whatever God is, God's got to be about that. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that I had a very similar experience with Aubrey. What this is <laughs> now 10 years ago. And I, uh, and I've mentioned this once on our podcast before, but I had been having very deep doubts for I don't remember how long it was, several months to a year. And it, in our tradition, especially like your marriage and, and I'm sure this is true for you too, is very much built on your faith, yeah. you know? And so it, it can be perceived as a betrayal if you, yes. if, if you start to deviate from the path that you had mutually yes. planned on when you got married. Yeah. And so I was terrified to tell Aubrey that what I was feeling I didn't know what her reaction would be. And we'd only been married for a, you know, a few years at that, at that point. And when I finally, when I finally told her, her reaction was just, it was just so, it was so Christ-like, you know, it was the exact, it was just like what you related with your friend, Tom. She yeah. didn't hesitate for a moment, you know, to express her love for me and the, and um, reaffirm the solidarity that we had. And I, and in some ways, you know, I, I and now it's, it's hard for me to even imagine you know, doubting what my relationship with Aubrey could be. And it's almost like because of that moment, you know, yeah. like that, that brought us together in such a almost inseparable way. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like a before and after, you know, and, and yeah. like you said, if that's not, if, if that type of, if that type of bond between, between people, that type of connection isn't God, then, you know, yeah. what is it? You know, I, th- 
this is reminding me so much of this conversation we just had really recently with a therapist about about um, religious OCD. And I just, she made this comment about the paradoxical relationship between what we try to control and how that controls us. Yes. You know, the more we resist and try to control it, the more it controls us. And I just feel like, you know, what you have both expressed was just this, as soon as you felt secure and you could let go of the resistance to doubt, then like it, it that's like what gives you peace and, and safety. And in some ways we feel like our relationship with the church is, you know, is, is unstable that if we express doubt, then maybe we're, we'll be purged, you know, maybe we'll be yes. pushed away. And I just wonder if you've seen that when people can totally accept doubt and stop resisting and stop pushing away, is that generally their experience that they're able to just breathe and work through this? Or, it, I mean, I feel like what our, our church leaders are genuinely afraid of is that if we embrace doubt and we stop resisting and we we stop trying not to doubt that we'll all be lost you know that we'll all yeah. lose any interest in god at all and i just wonder if this is one of those ways that we're trying so hard to control it that we're actually staying stuck in this in these perplexity stages because we're so afraid and we're, we're so resistant that there's just no we just can't move yeah well there's a um there's a saying in the addiction recovery world that we're one of the things is we're only as sick as our secrets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact that people feel they have to keep the doubt a secret, the secrecy and the fear, it seems to me, have very damaging effects. And, yeah. and the more afraid we are of the secret getting out in some ways, whatever harm doubts would do, I bet they don't do as nearly as much as the secrecy and fear. But there's another saying, we're only as sick as our reactivity. Um, and <laughs> when, when we're, we're in this reactive, oh no, I'm having doubts. Uh, it, I, I think the, the reactivity it also creates unhealth. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and I, but here's the problem. Uh, I, 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 I want to just be really honest. Even I think part of being a human being and being raised in a community is that even if the leaders all disappeared, you move to a different country, you move to a different planet and you're totally away from those leaders, they have like a little foothold in your brain. In other words, they mm -hmm. played a role in forming certain of the structures of your brain. And I think that's, part of what makes doubt so difficult. It's not just that I'm worried about what other people will think. It's that parts of my own mind still wow. are nervous about giving me permission mm -hmm. um, to think. And, that is so true. And, and one of the things that I think helps us deal with that is to just realize this is not just a problem in our church or our religion. This is a human problem. So yeah. if you met someone who grew up in a committed Marxist family and they believed that Marxism was the answer and they get a little older and they start having questions about Marxism, they're going to feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a It's just a community. Whatever your community, whatever your tribe is, you're going to have this that experience. This seems to be a problem that, that's a human problem across. And it, do you have, do you have recommendations for I mean, I, uh, for, I guess, general principles for finding a safe place to express those yeah. doubts. Because I like, when I first went through it, like I said, I, I, I felt like anyone that I expressed it to, it was, it was potentially dangerous, you know, psychologically. Yes. And I think a lot of people feel that way and they're grasping for uh, someone to talk to or a way to express themselves. How, how have you seen that happen in a, in a healthy way? You know, there, there's this uh, strange figure in literature um, across cultures it's the figure of the mysterious stranger someone comes to town and everything changes and before the outsider came in we didn't have a chance i mean et is a classic <laughs> story of the literally an outsider you know, yeah. comes um, but uh tim I, I think this is why very often the only safe person we can find is someone outside of our tradition mm. uh, uh, you know, it's, isn't it interesting in the story in, in the book of Genesis and the story of Abram, when Abram hears a call from God, he's specifically told, you have to leave your father's house. In other words, there are things that you're not going to be allowed to think in this context. 
and you're going to have to go on a journey. It's another theme in literature. It's called the hero's journey, the, the, uh, or it's called the coming of age story. The young person leaves home and goes on a journey, and they go through a series of ordeals, and they have a series of disillusionments, and then they find who they really are, and then they can, are, are able to come home. So very often, I think it involves, and sometimes this is why people read books, you know, they can read a book from an outsider that can give them, or they can listen to a podcast while they're driving in the car and nobody's around. And that becomes like this little secret space of being able to think freely. Yeah. I really think podcasts are super important right now for that reason. But I'll, I'll just tell you, like, I, I mean, I don't know if these names will mean a lot to folks from Latter-day Saints, but um, mm. uh, I remember I was in Sweden and I, was, I met a, Pente a Swedish Pentecostal pastor and he had gone through these deep period of doubt and he literally got on a plane and flew to Egypt and he found some monastic community way out in the desert. And that's where he went to tell them his doubts. Oh my goodness. It, totally different tradition, totally different part of the world, but something inside him said, it's not safe for me to talk about my doubts with mm -hmm. anybody. Uh, I don't know anybody I can trust, but I need to, I need to unburden my heart to somebody, you know? Sometimes mm -hmm. people go to a counselor, there are things called spiritual directors that are wonderful places to go. Yeah. yeah. It, there was this reflection question. I think it was the first question of the first chapter that made me think about this. And it was something like, what would you say if you felt completely safe? Like, what would you say about your doubts if you felt completely safe? And that was the most revealing question. I had never asked myself that. And it made me realize that there are a lot of things that I do keep my guard up about. And if there was somewhere, if there was a somewhere to go and say, you know, the darkest darkness, like what is the worst thing? Like, what is the thing I am really afraid to, that I don't believe? And, and it just, it, it, that feels like it would be so cathartic. And I think there's also something to be said for being able to articulate those feelings because then it, it gives you more confidence. I think sometimes it feels so much heavier because we've never actually been able to put it into words is just weighing us down. And as soon as you can articulate it, it just feels like you're able to process it a little bit better. And, and I think you, I've never heard someone suggest that before. And I think you're so right. Like if you can say that to someone who doesn't need something from you, that would just, that would be s such a beautiful exercise. Aubrey, when you say that, uh, gosh, it, it sort of breaks my heart because then I think, and what this means is that for so many of us, we've turned God into an unsafe yeah. listener. Uh, in fact, maybe God is the scariest listener of all. And I know some people struggle whether they even believe in God, but you think if a person could say, if anybody I ought to be able to be honest with, I ought to be able to be naked and unashamed before yeah. God. And, uh, but I know that's one of the things that our religions can do to us. They can make us afraid to even be honest with God. You know, we're, we're having to cover up. Yeah. Yeah. And in that way, like, wow, doubt really is a medicine, a medicine, you know, to like start questioning, like, why do, why am I afraid of this being that I, that I believe, you know, logically is the embodiment of love. You know, that seems like something there that needs to be challenged. Would you, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's a, a line of a famous poem by someone named Alfred Lord Tennyson who uh, said, uh, a line of his poem said, there's more of faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. So I heard you, I heard you say at this little um, book chat that we did a few weeks ago, something that I have not stopped thinking about. And it was, it was just this idea that you move from perplexity into harmony when you decide that you're, you don't want to be the broken one anymore. And you decide you want to start building you want to decide what your life, what you want your life to look like. And that is really resonated with me. Cause, and I think that, I think that's an important point because it's a place where people feel stuck. They want to get out of this doubt. And it, that was the most hopeful thing to just realize that you, you can make a decision to, to stop feeling broken and like you've lost something you're supposed to have. And that can be your first experience in this harmony stage. So do you want to yeah. give us a little yeah, more about- Harmony? Right. We haven't really talked much about harmony yet, and that's really important. Um, so the, the way I would say it is that, first, I don't want anybody to feel any shame about being in this stage of perplexity, because 
so many people feel so much shame and, and then mm-hmm. they feel I have to get out of this as soon as possible. Uh, and the way I, I like to say it is I think there's work for us to do in each stage and there's really important work in stage three. And I wanted to get out of stage three as fast as I could. I didn't like it. I was embarrassed <laughs> about it. And I think I actually, it's a little bit like you were saying before, I actually prolonged my time in stage three because I was fighting so hard against yeah. it. Yeah, but, that makes sense. But I do think there's so, something happens where you say, I know what I don't believe. I know what I'm against. I know what I don't like. What do I believe? What do I value? What am I for? What kind of a person do I want to be? Um, what am I committed to? I know I don't accept this authority structure anymore. I know I, I or maybe I accept it, but I accept it not as, it, you know, an all or nothing thing. And, right. And and, but okay, guess what? Now I'm having children and I'm the authority structure for my children. Yes. Yes. Uh, so now all the criticism I've heaped on every other authority structure, how am I going to handle being a person with some authority myself? And, mm-hmm. and all of that pushes us to say, I, you know, I've deconstructed enough. What am I going to construct? Or I've taken everything apart. What is there anything left? And what, what do I have left to try to build on? And that, uh, that to me is, is when that stage four work happens. And it's one of the reasons why I think I spent a lot of time going into stage three and trying to fix it, which put me back in stage two. I, I think mm. I, I, I kept riding that fence because I, I wasn't willing to say to myself, yeah, some of that is gone. Mm. Some of what I used to have is gone. That doesn't mean all is lost. Uh, there's still some precious things here. And in fact, the kind of person <clears throat> um, through what I've gone through in these first three stages is something that I would never want to lose, you know? And mm. I think when that begins to happen, there becomes a certain moment where you say, I'm going to stop condemning myself. I'm going to say, I haven't been, I haven't been a quitter. I've been persistent. Mm-hmm. I've kept on, kept on with, I haven't been, hateful. I've been loving. And in fact, all that other people told me was a doubt was actually my own quest for truth. And the quest for truth has a lot to do with faith. In fact, one way you can define faith is to say that faith is what makes us seek for truth that we don't yet know. Um, Certainty is the truth that we already know. But faith is what makes you say, there's truth that I don't know. And I'm willing to go out from what I already know because I'm curious and I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for what I don't know. And that faith that you say, I, I've been doubting a lot. Yeah, but gosh, my faith has really grown. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask if the transition that you see from, uh, from perplexity to harmony is qualitatively different than the other, like first two transitions that seem yeah. sort of like a, like really organic, like, from stage one to stage two, it just sort of happens from stage two to stage three. You definitely, most people don't want it to happen, but it happens. And I was, I was going to say, is stage three to stage four different because you've got to work, but it sounds like based on your answer, that's actually maybe wrong and that it is more, still more of a release than it is, a, you know, a climb. Well, I think, I think it's probably the part of the book that I, you know, I, I finished the book and thought there's still so much more to think about, about what that stage three to stage four transition looks like. So many people talk to me and they tell me their stories about it. You know, especially now that they've read the book, they feel like, oh, this gave language. Now I can see what I was mm-hmm. going through when I was 37, you know, and, and they, they remember and they can, we can start to tell those stories. So I don't think I, I, I think, I wish I had more clarity uh, uh, to offer on this, but one of the things that happens is that the, the stage one belief that we were told that there are certain authority figures who have it right and our job is to believe what they say. Mm-hmm. Um, in stage three, we throw that out. We get mad at those authority figures. At <laughs> stage four, we say, you know what? They were doing the best they could. They were wrong to pretend that they were more than they are. They're human beings. Now, they might have been bad human beings, they might have been good human <laughs> beings, or they might have been, you know, well-informed or not so well-informed, but they're human beings and they're doing the best they can. Mm-hmm. I've got to do the best I can. 
And once it turns back to me, you know, I think this may be a little bit what's in that powerful statement from Jesus in the Gospels when he says, don't try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye when you have a big stick in your own eye. It's when we say, what about me? How am I going to live? How am I seeing? How can I open my eyes? How can I deal with my own blindness? And I think mm -hmm. that act of taking responsibility does two things. It's really interesting. It's a profound act of individuation. It's a profound act of self-definition, self-responsibility. But it's also what it then says, and every other human being I know is in this struggle too. And now I have solidarity with them. And that word solidarity, I think, is a huge part of stage four. It's, 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 it's unavoidable when we deal with our own issues and our own pain that we realize other people are dealing with this too. <laughs> yeah. One, one way that you phrase that in the book, and I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting it here, but was that the beginning parts of stage, of a, of stage three in perplexity, there's a lot of suspicion that's sort of outward you know, based on or towards institutions yeah. and authority figures, et cetera. But near, nearing the end of the perplexity stage, the suspicion sort of turns a little bit more inward. Yeah, in fact, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you got it exactly right. So I, be, I become suspicious. I've been suspicious of everybody else. Now I become suspicious about my own suspicion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I realize, you know what? When I'm suspicious of everybody else, it gives me the right to look down on them and feel superior over them. That's not so good. And I've become mm -hmm. cynical about my own cynicism. My cynicism is me seeing through everything, being able to find faults in everything, which lets me feel superior to it. That's not so good. And, and at that point, I become cynical of my cynicism. Mm -hmm. And, and at, at that point, I just suddenly, it, it, that's why harmony is a little bit like a new simplicity. I'm now faced with this very simple question what kind of a life do I want to live? What kind of a human being do I want to be? Mm -hmm. And then I love this part toward the end of the book where you, then you bring up all these scriptures where Jesus is saying that love trumps everything, you know, of faith yeah. and hope and love, that love is the most important. And now that you've kind of led us to this place where we can to totally get behind this idea that faith is not defined as correct beliefs, but as this radical love. It, it's all there in the scriptures still too. And I, I just loved like how validating that was. Like, I love like reading through all those scriptures that are so familiar and they felt so different to not, to not need to define the gospel as correct beliefs. My goodness. Yeah, th that one little passage that I quote from the book of Galatians, uh, the only, in, in fact, if I quote the whole thing, uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Now, I, I remember when I was a little boy and I, my parents read the Bible at dinner and I said, what is circumcision? And when they told me what it was about, I thought that shouldn't be in the Bible. <laughs> I, I, was, I was scandalized. They were talking about penises in the Bible. You know. but, but when you realize that circumcision, uncircumcision are the boundary markers. They're how we know. Are you one of us? Are you one of them? It's the ultimate dualism. You're either an insider or you're an outsider. Ah. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Mm -hmm. and, and that's consistent enough in Paul's writings because a lot of people remember in 1 Corinthians 13, he says three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So this is what Paul got. And of course, it's what Jesus got in the great commandment to love our neighbors ourself. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's been there all along. It's been there all along, but maybe we were just too, we, we just weren't ready to see what was there yeah. all along, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, my friend Richard Rohr uh, says, uh, all the steps to maturity are necessarily immature. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. That's a very good point. <laughs> and, and so when he says that, it makes me realize, oh, of course, you know, and, and it maybe lets us have a little grace toward our religious yes. communities too. I mean, I know probably a lot of our religious leaders wouldn't ever want to say this, but it might be a way for us being gracious toward them. Of course, our religion is immature in some mm -hmm. ways. Of course, it's immature. Um, yeah. That's, and it, yeah. Can you talk about the tree ring? metaphor because yeah. this was this was so helpful i think i still have um this real tendency that if you lay out stages that are numbered i'm like okay 
what, how do you get to the top, the highest, the, <laughs> what's the best stage and like, how do we get there? And I really love this metaphor of the tree rings because it, it explained that in just a simple image that we need, that we, this is a foundation that we're building. We need to, to learn all of these lessons of, that each stage offers. Well, um, I, I'm glad that was a helpful metaphor. It, to me, it's the metaphor uh, first of all, it, it gets rid of steps that we're climbing steps or a ladder that we're climbing rungs or whatever, right? Um, yeah. But it says, okay, look, um, uh, when a tree starts, it's just a little tiny sapling. And after its first winter, it gets a second ring around that basic ring. But it's not that that basic ring was bad and it's not that it leaves that first ring behind. It will carry that ring with it for the rest of its life. And then the second year it gets a second ring, third year it gets a third ring. And, and, and uh, one way I think you could think about this in the course of a lifetime, maybe it took me 15 years to get to stage two, right? And then maybe I spent another 10 or 15 years in stage three. And then I bounced around and started ex ex extending into stage four. But you know, I think if you stay in stage four long enough, it becomes your new simplicity. And it, because it becomes, life starts to feel simple again. It makes sense again. I have a way that just sort of works, but guess what? Live long enough and some new complexity will come. Yeah. And I, I, I've noticed in my own life, this pattern sort of repeats itself. And, and eventually I think what happens is we start to realize, oh, the skills of simplicity and the skills of complexity and the skills of perplexity and the skills of harmony are all skill sets that we need and we'll need them for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Are there ways that we can, um, in our own community, make it easier to grow through those stages? Well, this is where we really have a tough, a tough challenge. Um, and if I can be very frank, I mean, you, you would have to say how this would work in your specific community, but I want to describe for you something that I've seen happen in the kind of evangelical Christian background I came from. Mm -hmm. uh, a young kid grows up, He's really a gung-ho Christian and decides, I'm going to go to Christian college. And uh, he goes to a Christian college because that's where the really sincere kids go. And about his second year, he starts having some doubts. I th I'm thinking of an actual person I know right now. This really describes him. He actually started to think, oh, no, I might be gay. Mm. And um, he... He was so afraid. Um, and so there was one professor, she was an English professor at his Christian college. And he thought she respects me so much. He was really good in English. And so he went to her and she was loving and she was accepting toward him. And so what she did, and then he found out that there were like 30 students who had come to her with various questions oh. and doubts. She was the one safe person on campus that you could go to. <clears throat> and so there was this little sort of secret community uh, where they were kind of experimenting with what I would call harmony or stage four. And it was this wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, his senior year, he wrote something on the internet about his questions and the president of his college called him in and threatened to not let him graduate unless he re recanted because he didn't want a graduate of their school to besmirch the school. Mm -hmm. And so what he found is you could create a little safe space, but there might be somebody else who's ready to pounce on you. <laughs> and, but you know what? That's reality. That's the world we live in. And I think what it means is that the safe spaces that be, can be created are unspeakably precious. And they're what give people a chance to grow. And, um, you know, sometimes it might take 200 years before the, the larger institution is going to be ready to be where that little group got to be in, you know, the junior year of college. But at least you found someplace. Where, where yeah. Those I, yeah. I, I was going to ask about this, too, because it seems like it, for many that have gone through those stages and find themselves in, in harmony, they, they might be on that sort of perimeter that Richard Dorr calls the edge of inside, yeah. you know, which um, I, I think is a, a really sacred space in a lot of ways because it, because it, it is able to sort of see, see both sides. Um, but I wonder too, if that's, 
if that's sustainable. And I, I like, I, I would, I, I see you maybe as someone that has been on the edge of inside, you know, for, for many years. And I, I wonder if you'd almost just share your experience and, and yeah. you know, let us know if that's, if that's possible to stay there. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. feel like even if they've, you know, gone through perplexity into, into harmony, it's sort of a never ending trajectory out of the, out of the tribe, you know? Yeah. And does, does that need to be, does that need to be the case? Yeah. You know, I hate to be prescriptive about this, but I also think I ought to try to be realistic and, and honest about it. So, um, Look, it, this stuff, you know, some stuff lives on the internet forever. So if anybody wants to find out about this, just search for my name on, just do a Google <laughs> search for my name or search for my name on YouTube. And you'll find out that there's, you know, all kinds of people who've done whole YouTube series about how I'm a child of the devil. I got interviewed oh, by, a, uh, I got interviewed by a, a journalist once in Europe um, and he was totally secular, but he was asked to interview me because I was coming to town or whatever. And so he'd done some internet research. And so when we met, he holds up this paper of printouts and he, and he said in his accent, do you know you are the son of Satan? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the fact is there are people, I call them gatekeepers inside mm. organizations and they, their meaning and value and loyalty to the organization show, is shown by being watchdogs or gatekeepers. And they find anybody who's, who's, not dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's correctly. And they, they shame them in hopes that they'll conform or they want them driven out. I, I got a call from a major Christian magazine that I was a columnist for. And the edit, one of the editors called me and said, I just came out of a editorial meeting where one of my fellow editors said, he's out to destroy you. Those were his exact words. So he said, I just wanted you to know, you know, watch your back. Um, so, wow. uh, and sure enough, a week or two later, he wrote a nasty uh, editorial to, you know, try to make me be not an, a true Christian or whatever. So mm -hmm. people will do that sort of thing. And I think you have to be prepared for it. But I think the more you're prepared for it, the less freaked out you'll be. And the more you realize it is absolutely inevitable. You know, when, when Martin Luther you know, said, uttered or, or posted his 95 theses, it was inevitable he was going to get in trouble. That's just mm -hmm. how life goes. But then the question is, how do you handle it? Do you handle it graciously? Do you handle it, you know, sometimes, you know, it's winning doesn't mean that you convince the authority figures that you're right. Sometimes winning means that you maintain a loving and gracious attitude toward them, no matter what. Yes. Um, and I think defining winning in the right way becomes really, really important. Um, uh, the, and, and it involves how do you hold your integrity? How do you be loving? How do you be patient and yet not compromise things that shouldn't be compromised? And mm -hmm. all of that happens. So, um, so if I were to offer one piece of advice on this, uh, Tim, here's what it would be. It would be, you realize I grew up in this circle and I might be on the edge of the circle and there might be people who want to constrict the circle to get rid of me. Well, all I'm gonna do is draw a bigger circle <laughs> that includes them. And, and that wow. desire to draw bigger circles I think is the, is, is the way that we can move into this without, yeah, w w without playing in games that we don't even wanna play in anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you mentioned before, you know, you could be a stage two Latter-day Saint or Catholic or whatever, and you could decide I'm gonna become an atheist. And you spend the rest of your lives beating up believers because now you're an atheist. But in a certain sense, you're, you haven't grown. Right. You're, you're just being combative with a different club. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So. So I have one more question that I just, we have to ask because I feel like this is something that we hear all the time. I feel like this is, this is a question that um, just really weighs on parents. Yeah. And, and that's that if they are growing through these stages of faith, I think that they often feel so worried that they're, they know that they don't want to give their kids negative messages that will become pain points with God later but they don't know how to do it any other way. So could you just talk about parenting and how, how do you make it less disruptive for children to grow through these stages that maybe are disruptive for us? Yes. 
Yes. Well, first of all, it really can happen. And the thing I'd say, I, I, I hope it's okay for me to, you know, give a plug for something here, but I have two friends who started, who wrote a book and started a podcast because they grew up in a very religiously, well, especially the wife grew up in a super repressive religious background. And mm -hmm. when they had children, they didn't want to do the same. And the husband, it just so happens is a child psychologist. And so, um, so they wrote a, a book called The Six Needs of Every Child. And they have a mm -hmm. podcast that's called Growing Connected. And, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. Help wow. parents of deep faith to find ways to be parents where they care about morality and they care about faith and they care about spirituality, but they aren't going to do the kind of damage to their children that their, their parents mm. unwittingly did to them, you know, or that yeah. this sort of religious system has unwittingly, unwittingly done to them. But here's what I would say if I were to give some of my own advice, like I think what they say is great, but if, here's what I would say. Yeah. If you have it very clear in your mind and heart that this thing is about love, uh, a friend of mine uh, who, who was a pastor and felt he lost everything, he, he came to me at one point and said, here's what I still believe. Life is a gift and love is the point. I said, well, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty yeah. good. Um, but if, if we're clear on that, then when we teach our children rules that we have to teach them, we really want them to say thank you. We really want them to yeah. say sorry. We really want them to not bite, steal, <laughs> hit, you know, and uh, all the rest. So we want to teach them right and wrong, but we always do it with a heart of love for the child because we realize we can be parents for something other than love. I'm afraid if you yell at your sister in public, that will be a bad reflection on me as a parent. Mm. Now, at that moment, I'm not acting out of love for my child. I'm acting <laughs> out of fear and shame and, uh, and mm -hmm. concern for my own reputation. And let's face it, in religious settings, an awful lot is done out of fear and not out of love. So we start saying, I would actually like to be a loving person and be motivated mm -hmm. by love, what's best for my child. That's our first struggle. Um, mm -hmm. But then we teach our child, hey, listen, the reason I want you to, to uh, say please and thank you is that that's a loving thing to do. I, it's a way of showing that you're not, that you care about people and you appreciate what they do for you. And, and the reason I don't want you to hit your little brother you know, with a baseball bat, is that we believe that love is important and you, we want to treat other people the way we'd be treated. And so we make love the reason for stage yeah. one. And then when they get older and they are learning skills so they can become independent, we say, well, listen, the reason these skills are important is so that you can not only take care of yourself, but so that you can then take care of other people because that's what loving people do. And stage three, listen, it's important for you to think for yourself. I welcome you having questions and doubts and challenging things that I've taught you. Um, mm -hmm. I, because I want you to be a person who loves the truth and you have to love the truth. You have to love the truth and still love people who you might think don't even have the truth. And then you're challenging them toward love at every step. I, I don't know yeah. if, if that makes sense. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember if it was in the book or on the podcast, but you talked about this metaphor of an old house and how, if you love the old house, you don't, you know, let it fall apart and you don't, move away yeah. you fix it you you know you renovate the bathroom and you put a new carpet and and that was a that was a really illuminating way for me to think of perplexity that even in perplexity like you were you can do this out of or you can you can um model that harmony for your children and when when they are in perplexity they'll be able to link that to love yes. and the other met you just got so many amazing metaphors mm -hmm. the other metaphors i really loved about this um you say somewhere that that these stages are not like calculus where you have to you know, master algebra and master geometry, and then you can learn about calculus that um, you say, you know, it's more like music and we should be exposing our kids to the best music, even when they're brand new students. That's right. That's right. Love is the beauty. Love is the beauty that, that we want to teach them from the very beginning. And so, yeah. uh, you know, they're not ready to play Mozart yet, but, um, but uh, even with their little scales, they're drawn to the beauty. And, yeah. and, and here's the thing, you can teach children to play the piano and they don't learn to love music. <laughs> um, they don't learn to love beauty. They don't even, nobody ever even explains it to them. It's all taken for granted. But mm -hmm. boy, if you teach a child to love beauty, then they'll, they'll, want, they'll want the music, you know, <laughs> they'll want to learn. Yeah.
Yeah. We were actually, uh, I'll wow. just share this little story with you. We were, we were inspired by your, by your book. And in our tradition, we have a, um, a tradition where every Monday night you get together, you get the family together. You don't go out for the most part. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but like, and you try to like, you know, talk together about some principle having to do with the gospel or, or whatever it is. Yes. And um, so after we read your book, we got our kids together who are 12 down to, down to three. And we had them list all the rules that they could come up with. And we went one by one and tried to trace them back to love. Oh, yeah. that's and so great. They were, they, were, they were actually so much better at it than I expected they, they could be. It was so beautiful <laughs> to hear. And some of them, we, they also had to learn the word arbitrary that night because some of them we couldn't come up with anything. So we said, yeah, that was, that was totally arbitrary. Um, but it was, really, it was really fun. And Aubrey and I learned a lot too. Like we take things for granted that we don't even think about until it's explicit, you know? Oh my goodness. Yeah. And that story is such a great example of um, Aubrey, what you were mentioning before. Um, because what you did that night uh, is you, you, in a sense, invited them into a stage three practice. You invited them mm. to critique the rules. And uh, you, in, you gave them permission to say that might be arbitrary, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that's to me, that's yeah. what a beautiful example of good parenting. I think that's great. I, um, um, I wonder if just to close, Brian, it, I, I would love for you to give two pieces of advice. One. Or, and maybe just general advice, not in that, and not in response to any specific question. But if you could just say one thing to two groups of people, the first being people that are in a deep uh, sort of perplexity stage and that are feeling maybe a little bit a little bit hopeless in in their doubt, and the second group of people um, are the loved ones of those that are in in doubt, uh, or the ones that they're the ones that yeah. they're speaking to or around that aren't necessarily going through it themselves. Could you could you say something to those sure. those two groups? Well. First, to the people who are in that stage three uh, perplexity. Um, the thing I would want to say is there's a surface to everything. And part of the work of stage three is seeing through the surface, peeling away the, the wrapping paper, peeling away the covering, you know. Um, in fact, when we use a word like discover, that's what we're saying, to discover is to find out what something is underneath the, the covering. Mm. And, and part of what doubt in that way is, is saying, you told me that this is a truth that came down from heaven. I found out that you, actually we got this truth by adapting that truth from those other people. And we didn't wanna be like those other people. So we made it go this way. And we found out there's a story behind it. And there's a, a, a way of being in stage three where you feel like you peel away everything and there's nothing left you take away all the covers mm -hmm. and there's and you see through everything everything becomes transparent and almost valueless and if you feel that way you you, you can be tempted to to say forget it I, i'll just jump back into stage one but the thing that i would say to a person in stage three is there is a way of seeing underneath the cover, where instead of everything becoming invisible, everything becomes radiant. Um, everything becomes, you find out that there, even though there might be problems with this and this and this, you do find out there's this little kernel of beauty. And to focus on that, that radiance um, is, I think, one of the ways that leads you through stage three to something beyond. And to the people who are really worried uh, about other people, I think maybe I would say two things. Um, when I was talking uh, a, a minute ago about, you know, the parent who's, their two kids are yelling at each other in public and what's really going on in their mind is people are going to think bad of me as a parent, right? So the thing I would say to parents and other loved ones is you better discern to what degree you are just afraid of being thought less of because your child isn't painting in the lines or working with the program. So become honest about that. Um, I have a little novel I, I've written that I haven't published. I, I don't know if I ever will, but there's this mother in, in, the, in the book who's been a kind of a crappy mother. And she gets to a point where she says to herself, I gave myself a son. I never gave my son his own life. Wow. 
um, he's always existed in my mind for my benefit. Mm. I've never wow. existed for his benefit. And, you know, this mother in this story is like 45 years old when she finally realizes that, that, and that's one of the gifts that could come to a parent to say, I didn't just give myself a child. I'm here to give my child a life. Mm -hmm. And this is part of, if this is part of my child's life, this is part of my job, you know, to help them. Um, and then I think the second thing I'd say is that your child will always remember the cruelty or the kindness that you show them in their moment of, of honesty with you. And I would just encourage every parent to be ready for when the moment of honesty comes, they better be sure that their first reaction is, is love because um, you know, they can apologize if they messed up, but those are wounds that, that, are, that don't go away in my experience. They're, they're wounds that always, the, the child can have grace toward the parent, but it would sure be nice for your mm -hmm. first reaction to be love. Yeah, and con conversely, like those, those wounds, you know, may, may scar, you know, but like the memory of the loving reaction exactly. is, just as, is just as memorable. You know, it's something in that fact, will stick with them forever. In fact, my, both of my parents have passed away in the last few years. And uh, I was just the other day taking a walk and thinking about my dad. And I remember a night where he was so angry at me. Oh, my goodness, he was angry. And he didn't even understand what he was criticizing me for. But a day or two later, I still remember he came to me and he was almost crying and he apologized. And he just said, I lost my temper with you. And that was really mm. wrong. And I'm really sorry. And, you know, I feel like when my dad was mean to me, that was not the truest and deepest part of him. When he apologized there, I was seeing the window into the deepest part of him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Brian. Man, this has just been incredible. The book and the conversation, we're just so grateful. Well, I yeah. have to tell you, if anything I said was good, that's nice. But I thought your questions and insights were way oh. better. Oh, I'm <laughs> really glad. You're far, yeah. you're far too kind. I'm really glad I could be with you guys. Yes, thank you, Brian. And like, just the the work, I mean, the podcast, obviously, the book, thank you so much. But like, the, just the work that you've dedicated yourself to uh, over these past decades is just so important. And, I, and, I, and we want you to know that it's reaching, you know, potentially far beyond what you even originally intended. It's uh, it's meaningful to us and to other people in our tradition. And, and just thank you so much. Oh, I take that to heart. Thanks so much. Thanks so much again for listening. And we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Brian McLaren. For more from Brian, you can go to his website at brianmclaren.net or check out his newest podcast called Learning How to See, which he hosts with Richard Rohr and Jackie Lewis. And if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It really helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.